very much, Dan Winter, for accepting this interview. You're welcome. It's an honor. Nice to see you. Thank you. It's such an honor to be interviewing you because you're one of the people out there that have been proving scientifically that spirituality and there is actually an, another realm outside of this this body. Can you tell us uh, a little bit more about your discoveries? Well, you know, my original work had a lot to do with the measurement of heart coherence, measuring empathy and love, as it were. I invented the heart tuner and the bliss tuner. We do a power spectrum of EKG uh, and EEG, and we could measure empathy and even enlightenment and bliss by using harmonics in the brain waves and heart waves. It's all at the website, uh, fractalfield.com. Um, but then, more recently, uh, I began to work with Professor Karatkov, who had, was one of the original ones to measure golden ratio in brain waves and peak perception and bliss. And we began to study the nature of the plasma around the body. And I worked with him, or studied with him. We did a lot of conferences together, measuring as his, his book, Light After Life, where he shows uh, actually literally what it is that you take with you through death. It's a plasma field. So we're teaching a lot about plasma physics and how that's your aura and how you get it coherent and what you take with you when you die. So you can all explain it actually on a scientific level. Because a lot of people, that the, for the septics is great, especially in France, there is a lot of septics. So if there is few little tips of things that we can explain on a scientific level to give to our friends, that would be lovely. Well, yes, I mean, basically, what's clear is the the plasma around a seed plasm, which is an electric field, is what makes it alive. And the same is true of your body, which you could call your aura, chi, shaktipat. And Karatkov's measurements of that are used by tens of thousands of doctors, the GDB system. And the amount of coherence in your aura, your electric field, as it were, is was called your ka in Egypt, meaning your boat into the underworld. And so when Karatkov then measured, you know, how long it takes your aura to leave your body after death, and we have the Clouvet form constants. We know what people see during the death experience, which is the full sequences of their DNA. Basically, death is a matter of getting an electric field into plasma projection. And there's a lot you can say about the hygiene for that, what, what it would take to do a successful death. And that's part of what we teach. So is there something uh, of, 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 a, of a DNA of the universe? Well, <clears throat> what we're saying is that one of the reasons when you die, you see what are called the Clouvet form constants. You can see the pictures at goldenmean.info slash immortality. That um, <clears throat> what you're seeing, spiral, lattice, cobweb, grid, um, that sequence of views typically seen by near-death experiencers are literally the sequence of folded, folding or braiding happening in your DNA for a reason. That your DNA is preparing your plasma for compression which is to say phase conjugate fractal implosion, and that's what then makes your electric field, your plasma, distributable. And the technical word for that in physics is a phase conjugate dielectric, which is an electric field that appears to self-organize. It's kind of the physics of the collective unconscious, and you don't sort of get in there and get your electric field, your aura, distributed unless you have something that is compressible, which is precisely identic identical with what's shareable or pure intention. So pure intention, coherence, and fractality are literally the same electrically. Mm. So, so, so tell us about the heart. Can you show us what happened inside of the heart when it starts opening up? Because I've seen you in some conferences showing how it's what's really happening in there. You yes, we. You know, <laughs> what's what the medical literature knew was that the number of harmonics in your heart, called harmonic inclusiveness and heart rate variability uh, equals the health of your immune system. So doctors often say the healthy heart is a fractal heart. But if you understand what that means musically, it means the most number of frequencies compressed into one place. And that's obviously idealized by golden ratio or fractality, perfect compression. So what I learned to measure, and I taught the Heart Math Institute to do this, was to measure the power spectra, the harmonics of the EKG during love. <laughs> and what we find is that when you, the simple story is when you say I love you, if you're actually telling the truth, that your 
your heart harmonics become coherent. Your heart becomes a laser. And that's increased in the number of harmonics present. All the animations are on the website. And, and that increase in the presence of, in, of harmonics indicates the number of axes of charge rotating or the number of dimensions your heart's in. And that's, that's called ascension. And it's literally embedding harmonic inclusiveness. So in practice, when you feel empathy perfected, your heart turns inside out electrically, recursively, and your aura gets big <laughs> because your, your heart's imploding. It just turns out to be measurable. And that's the story of the heart tumor. And then compassion. What is how, what what happens when when you have compassion? Well, the idea is that um, when you choose to feel someone's feelings outside you as if they were inside you, you make a picture in your heart, as it were, and your heart's fibers are akin to they're very fractal. And so, if the picture you make inside you of someone's feelings outside you are is is accurate then the inside looks like the outside, and that's called fractal. And that creates an electrical attractor which allows your heart to turn inside out, like a donut in a donut, or in bed, or implode. Become a fractal attractor. It's a very romantic kind of language. The thing is, it's, it's actually real physics, and your, your aura gets big if your heart embeds in larger and larger electric fields. But, the, you know, I would even tell a little story to that Maury, <laughs> Which is, um, you know, if you try to embed yourself, which is to say feel empathy for something that's not fractal, say a metal building, if you try to put your aura into a metal building and feel the building as if it's a living body, what happens is you are poisoned, actually. Whereas if you try to put your aura into a great sacred tree, your aura can embed and grow very large. So I don't recommend trying to feel empathy for everything. No. The fact is, you need to choose what to feel empathy for, for things whose aura is actually able to grow, which is to say living things, which is kind of an introduction of biologic architecture, that if you don't live in fractal structures electrically, your heart's in trouble. Oh, so we're talking magic here, because so you can literally, uh, how, how do you physic? how do you do this? You can, you can feel your aura, you can bond with yeah. that tree. Because we talk a lot about, a lot yeah, of people talk about oneness, and it's still a concept, I think, in yes. consciousness. It's not yet totally here, and people are... Can, can, you, can you share with us that part of, of that oneness, how, yes. how it works? Yes, that, that's exactly the right metaphor, but if you happen to be a scientist, oneness is precisely perfected compression. That's what allows many to become one, which is precisely fractal. What that means is... The electric field of that great old tree is profoundly electrically fractal, embedded, compressed, perfectly branched, you know. And that's why when you sit under it, your, you, your vision gets clearer. You, your perception goes to peak. Whereas if you sit under a metal pole, the opposite happens to your aura. It, because the metal is opposite to fractal and not charge embeddable, not charge compressible. Basically, when you touch metal, your aura is destroyed. When you touch something that's a phase conjugate dielectric called alive, your aura can breathe through it. So your body, spiritually, is only as large as the electric field it can embed in. So a metal building, unfortunately, is literally eventually kind of a soul destroyer because your aura can't breathe through it. And that, we have good physics for that. So how do you deal with the, the, the computer and our day-to-day -day lives uh, surrounded by metal? Does it mean that we have to really consciously spend some time in nature and urgently? <laughs> well, you know, the, the, the people like um, Jasmahim who teach, you know, how to live without food, one of the first things they teach is you need time barefoot in nature. That's when you're absorbing charge, which is the food. So, yeah, you need a few metal things, like I'm looking at a Mac computer here. <laughs> You need a few metal things in your aura once in a while, but ultimately the time when your aura is growing is the time when you're getting immortal. And your aura is growing best when you're not surrounded with metal or electrosmog, but you're surrounded with electric fields which are compressible, and that fractality actually defines sacred space. You know, we tell the story, um, Dr. Karatkov, someone of our hero, he was traveling in South America, and he found that the place where the shaman, the kogi, would go to speak to their ancestors was precisely a place where fractality in air was measurable. So 
that measurement, defining sacred space, is very simple. It's a measurement of whether a spark has a place to go, whether charge is in fact distributable. And that's precisely what defines sacred space, because that determines if your aura can unpack, you see. The goal here in a science of spirituality would be growing your aura, learning how to absorb charge. And it's not just selfish, because actually when you do something shareable, that's when you absorb the most charge. <laughs> mm. So what are your recommendations in order to grow our aura? Dilly, what, what, what did your discoveries well, brought? Well, you know, actually, I, I wouldn't say I have that much new information about that. It's, it's a, con a confirmation of what we already knew. You need live food, happy DNA, a vital fresh food that has lots of charge and that spark is the life force and you need to avoid eating angry DNA which is avoiding monocultured things like wheat and corn monoculture makes DNA angry and stupid and if you eat it you get angry and stupid and so fractality equals genetic diversity so there's something about food in there obviously and then there's the fact that as you have more and more bliss you need the inner electric muscles to, to steer the lightning and that's called yoga which is obvious you know you need that strength so you have the category of diet and the kinesthetic, and then you have the third, which is environment. You, you need to learn to seek always the place of charge so you can keep growing your aura, which means, you know, make a magnetic map of your bed and your house and your village. If they all look like a rose, then you've got a good shot at it, you know. And the fourth, fourth area we talk about is that more esoteric about rites of passage and alchemy and initiation, that sort of thing. So we teach a scientific hygiene for bliss which is not that un unlike other spiritual traditions, but it's all based on pure science. 